Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. My name is Robert. Let's go ahead and get started. Thanks so much for taking time out on your Sunday to be with us. This is the latest installment of our Enslaved series. Oh, that's the wrong title. Hold on. Let me flip over onto that. So we always welcome people to introduce themselves in the Zoom chat or the Q&A. You can let us know your first name, where you're connecting from, and what are you looking forward to this fall? And we don't do a Zoom demonstration in these programs, but just real quick, there's usually only a couple things that people ever have questions on. One is the sound. So everyone except Edward and myself will be in listen only mode or muted. If you do want to raise or lower the volume on your session, you can check the settings locally on your own device. If you want to adjust the screen display so that the slides that Edward is going to be showing take up your full screen on your device. If that's not currently happening because you see the boxes that have our pictures and names in them, you can make those go away at your end by <coughs> something on your device called either view or view options. And there's a feature called side-by-side -side mode that you can check off. Throughout our program, if you have any questions, comments, thoughts, opinions, ideas, perspectives, memories, et cetera, et cetera, feel free to type those in the Zoom chat or Q&A or in the comment section if you're following us on Facebook. And Edward will try and answer those questions when he gets to the end of our program. Um, let's see, those of you not familiar with us, we're Washington DC History and Culture. We're a nonprofit community organization. And we give people the opportunity to experience the history and culture of Washington, D.C. and the world. My name is Robert Kellerman. I'm the founder and the director of the Washington, D.C. History and Culture Organization, and I'm not your presenter today. I'm just more of the MC, so to speak. But Edward will be hosting you. Edward is a professor at Georgetown University, and this is the latest of a series of programs that Edward has been doing on the history of slavery and related topics. And if you want to find the other programs, they're on our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is Washington, D.C. History and Culture. We have over 100 uh, live stream programs that we recorded that you can find on there. And just to give you a sense of some of the previous topics, the first one was called Enslaved Washington, 1790 to 2021. Part two was Empire of Blood, talking about Europe and slavery. Part three was Slaver Nation, 1495 to Jim Crow. Two sessions ago, we had Slavery and the U.S. Economy. And last month's program was Rise, Black Resistance. And so again, we've recorded all these previous programs. Edward has been kind enough to allow us to do that. And they are on our YouTube channel, which you can find uh, Washington, D.C. History and Culture. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Edward. Um, Edward, you want to say hello? I'm going to turn off my presentation, stop sharing the screen. I'll turn it over to you. Are we scheduled to go for two hours today? Uh, less than that, probably, but who knows, right? Okay, no problem. We'll take as long mm -hmm. as you want. We'll be here as long as, probably an hour and a half. <laughs> okay, no problem. Take as long as you want. And again, if, if anyone has any questions or comments, type them in the Zoom chat or the Q&A or the comment section Facebook, and we'll forward those to Edward at the conclusion of today's program. All yours, Edward. Take it away. All right. One second. I always have this particular difficulty. Oh, it's okay. There we go. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is... Uh, within hearing is safe and healthy and taking care of um, your people and being taken care of. Uh, thank you for number one for being part of what is a work of learning for all of us. And this is the first of really a half of a series. This is white. The next one, the other half of this is called legal. So um, the title here comes from free white persons, which is the first bill of naturalization a month or two after the ratification of the constitution in 1790 to the white ethnostate. state uh, an ethno state is more accurately called a nation state and it's a word that we'll talk about a little bit later so let's um we are the voice of the new embattled white minority um white is a rationalized Christification of people as skin color specifier generally used for people of European or origin. Although the definition can vary depending on context, nationality, and point of view. What I'm going to try and do today is really a fourth of a four, four series 
on the development of white. And you know, one of the topics is, is how Jesus became white and learned to love the Confederacy, how white people became, how pink people became white, um, uh, how the Confederacy used whiteness in terms of Jim Crow. Uh, this is more, we'll touch on all of these topics briefly, but specifically this moves pretty quickly into kind of the contemporary uh, issues of how how race, specifically white supremacy, used as a politic. <clears throat> and my definition of white would not be white as a color, but that white is a practice. Senator John Calhoun, if folks know him, uh, who is really the architect of the Southern Confederacy. We have never dreamed of incorporating into our union any but the Caucasian race, the free white race. Ours, sir, is the government of a white race. This is in 1858. Uh, you can see how pretty close we are to the, the Civil War. Making America white. White isn't a color, it's a practice. The advert you see on the right is a Coca-Cola ad, white customers only. It's a Coca-Cola ad on a machine in 1950. This is not even a store, a grocery, it's a machine. This was in The Guardian of a couple, couple months ago, the invention of whiteness, the long history of a dangerous idea. Robert Baird writes, before the 17th century, people did not think of themselves as belonging to something called the white race. But once the idea was invented, it began quickly to reshape the modern world. And we're gonna look through, take some very quick steps through how that developed. Uh, Thomas Phillips, a, uh, a seaman in the 17th century, he writes in his journal, I, I can't think there's any intrinsic value of one color more than another, nor that white is any better than black, only we think it's so because we are so. Way back when, in terms of thinking about uh, the early uh, med medieval Europe, the 10th to the 13th centuries, uh, an appearance of heresies and the establishment of the Inquisition, things that we hear about, the appropriation and mass, mass murder of Jews, the propagation of elaborate measures to segregate lepers, curtail their rights. These were traditionally seen as distinct and separate developments and explained in terms of problems which victims presented to medieval society. We still have that kind of notion that dirt is matter in the wrong place, it needs to be cleaned up. But uh, Thomas More in a wonderful book talks about how deviancy and power became part of a bureaucratic society as early as 19, uh, 950 and 1250. And on the, on the right hand side, you see Jews and Muslims under the Fourth Lateran Council, in which it set out a code of practices in which certain kinds of people were segregated from certain other kinds of people in which certain kinds of people, usually Jews in this case, and, and Muslims, uh, wore certain kinds of clothing. Uh, the gold star was one of them. Uh, a, a red sash was another. These were actually elements that had been borrowed from the protocols of Omar in the ninth century, um, Muslim caliphate. But so that the, the kind of segregating and racializing of a specific persons and group of persons was at this point less about color than about deviancy and being part of culture. So these were connected. Dominance was the end product and blood and race became, uh, blood and ra race was not even a term at the time, but uh, more, more, more at this in her nation. Geraldine Hang in The Invention of Race, she writes this, uh, race is a structural relationship for the articulation and management of human difference rather than a substantive content. We will see that Thomas Jefferson understands this this way. Why is this important? Religion was a paramount source of authority in the Middle Ages, and it functions socioculturally as well as biopolitically. That is, quote, this is uh, Ms. Heng, subjecting peoples of a socially degraded faith to a political structure of theology can biologize, define, and essentialize an entire community as fundamentally and absolutely different in an interwoven cluster of ways, socially, economically, politically, and morally. So you begin to see here how race, as it slides into kind of a Venn diagram with religion, becomes a way of managing persons and hierarchy persons 
Limpesia de Sangre, which is 1494, kind of a concept in Spain for, for blood purity. We will see how, and at this particular time, it is sorting out old Christians from new Christians, uh, conversos, um, morescos, persons who were converting to Christianity, uh, usually from Judaism, um, but who were, for that reason, suspect. So you will see the purity of blood concept as it becomes increasingly developed and, and actually is put into colonial law in Virginia in 1705. Uh, and where they said that in the one drop rule in 1705, which defined, essentially, defined the lack of whiteness and whiteness in 1705 in Virginia became the term by which formerly persons known as Christian, for example, or, or Englishmen would now be, as long as they could hold themselves as white, they could advance in society. Uh, when we think about whiteness developing, and I'm gonna, you're gonna, there's a few slides here that I'm gonna point to. Um, you're gonna come over here and you'll see Queen Elizabeth, uh, Queen Elizabeth I. She's important because she, she, this is in 1653, 1658, uh, 1558, sorry, uh, she comes to the throne kind of as an adjunct. She wasn't intending to be, but one of the first things that she did uh, kind of by accident was to, to uh, send her, her general, uh, John Hawkins, whom we'll see, uh, out to the seas. And so you're right at the beginning of what we would call the age of exploration, what I call the age of despoilation. So Hawkins in, 16, in 1563 becomes really the first slaver. He brings 300 Moroccans back uh, as enslaved persons. And uh, the queen later knights him for this. But in this particular context, we begin to see, suddenly people see other people that look differently than they do. So for example, in the Tempest, and you have here, uh, you, you know, we know the Tempest, it's information about the Virginia settlement and the shipwreck near Bermuda of the colonial governor in Caliban and Prospero. Miranda, we know the story, I'm not going to go through it here, um, but essentially you have here visually that you can see white people or pink people um, having to, not knowing what to do with persons who do not look like them. Uh, even in Shakespeare's uh, Othello, you see here um, the Moor here, who is, as much as Elizabeth, could be white. So that gradually there became a dynamic of how color settled into, and that white is only defined in terms of what it, what what they were experiencing. Probably white persons in print was a 1613 comment by an African king in a play by John Middleton. He says, "I've never seen such white persons filled with um, this kind of a comment." So it's about the beginning of the 16th century with Elizabeth and the age of the exploration where the British and the Europeans become more and more into contact with people essentially in the Caribbeans and the colonials. Okay, now remember, we're gonna talk about Columbus a bit here, that from 1495, when he landed in the Caribbean, and, and that's partly Caribbeans where we kind of get the word cannibal because that was the, the word that they were using back and forth at that particular time, the Caribs. Uh, these persons, and he actually brought enslaved um, persons from the islands back. Uh, maybe he didn't find the gold that he wanted, but it was this suddenly now this cross-cultural encounter to what we would call, quote, the new world or the brave new world. So suddenly this play becomes a sense of, of what we would call post-colonialism, how one world and one race or one group of races or one nationality uh, as the European nations began to settle on a kind of a group identity. So, Sir John Hawkins, uh, Lisbon Slaver, 1563. Um, this is important because th this is what you have at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm not going to read you the, the, uh, the, the, what do you call it, the program note on it, but uh, su suffice it to say that uh, enslavement of any kind is rarely mentioned in it. This was a couple years ago. It has since been changed. So that partly what we're understanding here is that the, the dominance of the narrative is no longer the received world that once we had. And places like the National Gallery and other uh, museums are suddenly, as I say, you know, these are keepers of memory. Suddenly they're asking themselves, whose memories are we keeping?
So a, a question, how did Europeans use the idea of race to justify colonialism? And race, again, is it's not a term that would have been used at a particular time. But white supremacy and colonial empire exist in symbiosis. Empire depends on the creation and maintenance of racial hierarchies. Deus volt, it is God's will, 1096 First, Cru First Crusade, Pope Urban. So when we talk about a holy war, that expression comes from the lips of the reigning Pope in 1096. It is not Islam, and I and we're just gonna re mention that. In 1494, six months before Columbus lands in the Caribbean, uh, the Pope at the time, uh, Nicholas, splits the new, quote, new world between Spain and Portugal because suddenly this world was beginning to see that there are too many people going this way and who's going to, who's this going to be? So that the European exploration of this particular world wasn't an exploration, it was, uh, it was, it was unlicensed greed, straight up, okay? And that Spain, Portugal in 1444 becomes really the first slaver capital. And to this day, whenever you see maps of the, of the triangle or of the enslavement triangle, you never see the, you, know, you never see Portugal, Portugal and Spain, quote, blamed for this. Um, but in other words, you see them going out, but you never see them taking responsibility for that. So, so a, a couple things here. Um, the Sudan United Mission, and uh, you, you can look at what we call the scramble for Africa in the late uh, 19th century, where in, in about 25 years, 90% of, uh, of, of the African nations were simply taken over by, by European nations. This one, particularly Belgium, France, Italy, uh, and others. So he says here, uh, colonialism is a form of imperialism based on the divine mandate designed to bring liberation. And look over here to the image and you can see this is very liberating. Um, and I don't wanna read the whole thing here, but I also wanna point out that this kind of rhetoric, we have it ourselves in, for example, you have here Senator John Hammond, again, speaking to uh, our Congress. Fortunately for the South, she found a race adapted to that purpose for her hand. A race inferior to her own, but eminently qualified in temper, vigor, docility, and capacity to stand the climate to answer all her purposes. And by the way, if this sounds like Jefferson later sounds like, or if he's, if he's, this sounds like Jefferson's um, kind of apologia for enslavement back in, uh, in 1782, it is because Jefferson becomes the person whose words ground the South in all of this. Uh, Hammond in 1558, again, we use them for our purpose and call them slaves. So uh, now to Columbus, and uh, Columbus, this, this is not a pleasant subject, and I want to, this is a picture on the, on the right is a woodcut by, an Af uh, by a, a Spanish uh, Franciscan of what, what the Spanish were doing to the, the Arawak Indians, uh, indigene. Columbus in his journal writes, let us go in the name of the Holy Trinity to go on sending all the slaves that can be sold. He goes into much more detail there, uh, but I think we probably trashed uh, Columbus enough to understand that um, the uses that we have put to his name now really can use some rethinking, but that when uh, the Washington Post calls uh, his work genocide, and the Washington Post does this, it's perfectly clear when, you, when they look at the numbers and what happened when Columbus, uh, Cristobal Columbus, a, a gentleman trainer, uh, uh, lands in the Caribbean and what he does when he gets there. Um, in 1492 and 1495, he returns to Spain uh, bereft of any gold that he intended, but he did bring five boatloads of the Iraq Indians, no natives back. He then signed a contract with Isabella, the, the, the queen of Spain, for 10% of any commission on enslaved natives that he brought back. Um, so, in through all of this, you have this notion that the, in terms of the European, uh, that it was kind of their colonial right, their right to simply uh, take to hand whatever the access that they wanted. Uh, religion very often became part of this, and I think in the last time someone asked me, so did I think that Christianity was a, a colonial religion? Uh, and I'm speaking as somebody who is within the church, of course it is. I mean, it, it's a, it, that's what it does. It still does this in lots of times and ways. Um, they might call it something different, 
Um, but usually the problem starts with having somebody else who thinks differently than we do or I do. White supremacy is we understand it, and we'll talk about that, as roots in the, the now discredited doctrine of scientific racism, which through the late 17th and early 19th century, 18th centuries, you would find that they would go around and figure out that these persons look differently than we, and again, I refer, reference you back to Jefferson in Notes on Virginia, uh, and he has a very aesthetic notion of the difference of, of people rather than getting into the biology of it or how, or how these persons function, he looked at how they looked and the color of the hair and you know, the shape of the skin. So scientific racism simply set out to measure. And Linnaeus starts doing this and um, Blumenbach and others, they start taking cranial measurements and they, they start figuring out that certain kinds of people are either better or worse, depending on kind of how they looked and what they did and how they underlined it. It, it underlines a spectrum of contemporary moments neo-confederates, neo-Nazism, Christian identity. Christian identity is, is actually a branch of Christianity, which is anti-Semitic rather than anti-Black. Uh, we'll talk more about that. So in this sense, and this is where Robert borrowed from my title, racism is a fundamentally, a, a race is fundamentally a theory of history. And further, that is a theory of dominance. It's a theory of who is whom, of who belongs, who does not belong, who deserves what, and who is capable of what. It's what will end today with the, the kind of the national, national community in terms of a of kind of a, a Trumpian view in 2020. So European exceptionalism, westward the course of not yet the white empire. What a wonderful 1845, I think this is image. No, this is 1872 image uh, of Western Ho. And you can see details over here. You can see the manger and you can see the cross. Uh, you see the conflict happening over here. Um, it's it's an origin it's an ordinary fantasy. In other words, it's what gave a manifest destiny by a publisher in 1848, or 100 years later, or 200 years later, which provides a rational narrative by which we can therefore say, oh, well, this was ours by divine right. So it's not much different than the divine right of kings. It's what I call the God card. As soon as you bring God into a conversation, well, God told me to do it. That shuts off any kind of con any kind of uh, conversation at all. So the the, the colonists, the, let me move this for a second. The the colonialist weapon, a geographical imaginary and a politic of extermination. And uh, I use the word a couple times, and I I want to point out that the word comes from um, Jefferson's uh, notes on Virginia. But it's in his Declaration of Independence where he obliquely responds to the Royal Proclamation of 1763, by which King George basically said, all right, folks, um, boys and girls, this is where the indigenous live. This is the national politics of places of the, of the Indians that you're in, and this is the colonies. And he draws a line, and the first peoples in, in Canada still, they, have, they use this as their legal approach to court and reparations and justice because according to the Royal Proclamation, the king set aside the whole half of the country as being indigenous or what we would call Indian. A very interesting uh, image, and I will tell you, it will probably um, give some sense some people to um, a dictionary or at least an encyclopedia. This is a 1770 image uh, in uh, Southern Germany and it reflects the scientific discourse at the time on heredity and skin color and variations in races. Uh, you see here Adam, all the animals, and you see Eve. Here's the black Eve. You see over here two maybe simian persons, maybe pre-Adamites. We'll talk more about that. So you have the, the usual uh, accoutrement of the Garden of Eden, and um, you begin to kind of wonder. You see all the animals lying down with, uh, you could write out a Thomas Cole film. But in particular, the three people here that you are one talking about, that, that, that this is 1770, and Blumenbach and Linnaeus, Linnaeus is um, four types of the, of the human in 1757, uh, homo afero, homo euro, homo um, asiatic. Basically, there are four colors, uh, uh, white or pink, I guess you would call it, 
uh, brown, yellow, and, and black. And he would characterize them. And any description is, of course, explanatory. So any of our uh, descriptions of how these people were, were based upon our own prejudices of what they did. But even at the beginning of the time, they're, he's be, they're beginning to understand. And what Linnaeus does, uh, it was most remarkable, for the first time, he reinstates the human being into biology because the Christian church, the Catholic church in particular, uh, basically followed um, a, a Aristotle who has the human being uh, as a quadruped, as some kind of animal, but he didn't specify what. And Christianity, in order to safeguard kind of Genesis, uh, refused to move that. But Linnaeus finally puts an end to the hegemony of the Christian church in terms of the, of the, of the propriety of, of that single creation. Uh, and so you have here the possibility of, the, of the, what we call the pre-Adamites. This notion is that they're trying to sort out that where all these, you know, Link and Blumenbach and Jefferson and the polygenesists are saying, well, who are all these people that we're seeing? Who are all these non-pink, non non-white people? who are clearly, uh, as, as Jefferson says, they're clearly persons, but they're clearly less than we are. They're clearly, they're not as gifted, they're not as whatever, they're not as attractive. This is again, Jefferson, you can read Jefferson on it. Uh, so they're trying to puzzle out the relationship. And here in 1770, you have an image of uh, clearly a person of pink persuasion and clearly someone who is not Caucasian. Caucasian comes from Mr. Blumenbach in 1795. He says the most beautiful persons are those in the you know East Caucasus mountains, which also, by the way, is where the Islamic folks managed to find their their Slavs, their slaves. So it's it's a it's a been a, it's a busy period of time right, right there. So the notion that the Confederacy will pick up in in 1840, 50, 60, 1850, 60, 70 uh, as an argument for the Confederacy, well, they, they they will go back to read the Book of Eden, the Book of the Bible. And they will blame this person's fall on this person, not because she ate an apple or, or some kind of fruit, but because she was, as you see, a person of uh, a black persuasion. So that meant that there were some other kinds of persons in the world who did not come from the Bible, and he called these the pre-Adamites. But this is also the time of scientific racism where these kinds of persons were beginning. In fact, uh, Jefferson's notes on Virginia was an attempt to, to answer a, a, a French uh, biologist uh, about um, how the different countries work biologically. Um, American Progress, 1872. I love the White Angel, of course, already at this time. So 100 years after Jefferson's nod to extermination and the Declaration of Independence, and wait for it, we'll talk about this, uh, you have this notion, again, of manifest destiny and you know, she's looking west, and here you have James Fenimore Cooper, uh, the last of the Mohicans. So one of the other part of the original narratives is that the Indians, alas, are gone. Well, of course they're gone. We killed every one of them. I mean, this was Martin Luther King's point in a telling comment in 1963, why we can't wait, where he was the first time in that century the person used, before the UN, but used the word genocide. So here you have Robert Frost, and I did my PhD uh, on the man. Uh, at John F. Kennedy's inauguration, he says, the land was ours before we were the lands. She was our land more than 100 years before we were her people. Well, uh, that's true, she was. Um, but she wasn't ours in Massachusetts, in Virginia. She was not at all. That the indigenous and the, the, the captive Indian, to use that particular term, uh, the captive Indian persons in the colonies, uh, which is not ever talked about, which I will be talking about at a certain particular point, that the way we have shaped the narrative around enslavement, that we paid no attention at all to the 125 years before 1619, which was largely indigenous persons. Okay. Um, so the point that I'm making here is that already you're beginning to see it play to the land vaguely realizing westward, still unstoried, artless, unenhanced. Well, um, be that as it may to Mr. Frost, there was all, already a lot of story that was happening. 
and much of it at odds with the facts on that. In hoc signo vinces, ec in toto victo. Redeemer nations, holy wars, the city on a hill, deus volt. The concept of exceptionalism and religious race nationalism, and I put religious and race, uh, kind of they're the same. I mean, I don't necessarily, I don't distinguish any longer um, the way it's, it's happening, the way it's understanding, the way our discourse works is that religion sometimes becomes code for race and race certainly becomes code for religion. And it's not limited to the, to the United States, um, for, for example, we know this. Um, but uh, back, back to Dominion, for example, I mean, this was the theopolitics of, the, of Genesis in which the church took great pains to, to satisfy is that uh, in the beginning, the divine created and gave them dominion, rahla, over all these persons and creatures and things. And um, most of the time we have a misreading of Genesis and people who eat meat misread Genesis. And, you know, when Genesis says, uh, to every seed uh, and every seed bearing fruit I give you, I give you for food. Um, oh, well, where did this meat stuff come from? Anyway, that's a different, it's a different narrative. Um, but the, the Christian ethos of uh, the developing Mediter Mediterranean communities, the European com communities, the relations between uh, Jewish ritual and Christian ritual and, and Islamic, which are related, obviously related persons. So there, the, 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 there's like three siblings and all of them are at each other's throats constantly. Um, and for, the, for, the, for a great period of time, up until about, a, up until about the first uh, crusade, quote, end of quote, and, Crusade doesn't mean cross, it means um, gathering in the way that they, they use it over here. But there were the uh, Jewish persons and Christian persons kind of more or less lived more or less in peace through the sort of earlier parts of um, the medieval ages. But it was as more set out, it was in the, the democratizing, the bureaucratizing of the society that suddenly persons became to be identified as bearers of social ill. Um, and we see the early whitening of the rhetoric and white again is not a concept that that folks are, re are really kind of familiar with but you begin to see in the u.s and colonial discourse the systemic erasure of non-european uh jean de Crocover, le letters from an american farmer and Crocover is not even american and he's a brit okay this is 1782 I mean, the ink is not even yet dry on the war on the revolutionary war Whence came all these people? They are a mixture of English, Scotch, Irish, French, and by the way, Irish, um, well, they, they were quickly written out of uh, things pretty quickly, as we'll see. French, Dutch, Germans, and Swedes from this promiscuous breed that race now called Americans have arisen. Well, um, maybe. What then is the American, this new man? He's either a European or the descendant of a European. Well, you know, I've, you know, I've spent my lifetime teaching American studies and I will tell you, uh, we have had all of these texts and no one ever taught me this in school. We read this and it's very self-flattery, self-grandiose. Self Hence the strange mixture of blood that you will find in no other country. And we have that kind of that blood fetish again here. So before you had race, you had blood, you had blood, you had blood. Um, you had the purity of blood, so now we have a mixture of blood. And it, it really is a, it, it's a, a provocative kind of a concept to think about. Here, individuals of all nations are melted into a new race of men, maybe women too, maybe, whose labors and posterity will one day cause great changes in the world. Well, um, it's clearly not a melting pot. Um, they would like it to be. It's an image of great violence and uh, there certainly is that in the in the, in all that all this exceptionalism, uh, the violence was exceptional. Thomas Paine, whom we know, in Europe and not England, is the parent country of America. This new world hath been the asylum for the persecuted lovers of civil and religious liberty from every part of Europe. And if that sounds like the Confederacy, we'll talk about it. And again, all Europeans were, were not equally equal, and we know this. Uh, we talk about Irish pubs and Irish bars. Irish, an Irish bar was the equivalent in the 1840s as of a gay bar. It was a place where those kinds of persons could go, could find identity and be there, uh, where they would know that they would find like-minded people and there would, there would be some degree of safety. 
that's so, uh, under Cromwell's the um, British uh, Irish conflict, the, um, the Irish came over as enslaved persons themselves. A different story. So here, listen to Franklin Benjamin, his petulant remarks about Germans, the Deutsch. Why should Pennsylvania, founded by the English, become a colony of aliens, who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of our anglifying them? and will never adapt our language or customs any more than they could acquire our complexion. And by the way, Pennsylvania founded by uh, Penn. Uh, Penn here is the son of the father who, um, who founded the colonies of Jamaica for the British. Those who come hither are generally the most ignorant, stupid sort of their own nation. This is Franklin. They herd together and will soon so outnumber us that we will not, in my opinion, be able to preserve our language and even our government will become precarious. I wish the number of purely white people were increased. Now, I have to say, it's not until really 1705 that you begin to kind of hear that kind of language uh, in this particular country. That, um, that Theodore Allen in his book, The Invention of White, which is a fabulous two set of books, uh, points out that you won't ever see uh, in any of the laws the expression white uh, describing anyone um, until about 1665. Everyone is either a Christian or, or an Englishman. And when they want to condemn someone for being other, they will talk about them as being non-Christian or non-English or, um, or, or a Moor of some kind. 2015, Jared Taylor seems to be channeling Franklin. He denies that things you love about America are rooted in certain principles. Rather, they're rooted in certain people. Again, kind of the biologism, the, the race and blood. White people, Germans and Swedes and Irishmen and Hungarians could come and contribute to the America you love. Well, um, do you really believe, he says, that a future Afro-Hispanic, Caribbean, Asiatic America will be anything like the America your ancestors built? White nationalism is more important than inalienable rights because, quote, even when they violate your principles, white people build good societies. Even when they abide by your principles, non-whites usually don't. I'm not so sure I know how to unpack all that. He says, I'll put it bluntly, nothing you love will survive without white people. So there you go. The sense of European entitlement evidenced in our first law now backed by 300 years of colonial practice in 1790. So we now have this notion that the Europeans came together and they, they saw people in the, in the age of despoilation, they looked differently from them. And so after all of this sorting out by 1790, not long after the ratification, the new nation's earliest laws dictated white only. You see it right here. Acts of the First Congress of the United States being a free white person. And you say, well, how is this possible? I thought white people were by definition free. No, as a matter of fact, the Irish about whom we just spoke came in as indentured servants. Uh, and the point here is no servants could be, and no person who was in any kind of bondage of any particular kind, that the word that they're not saying here is property holder, okay? and which is going back to the declaration when Jefferson borrows from, uh, from Locke, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of, Jefferson says happiness, the expression from Locke is life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. So, but not until 1952 was this requirement technically lifted. So, it's a whole long time. So, blood and the hardening of a race practice. White becomes a gatekeeper, and you see this very definitely in 1705, the Virginia uh, laws, by definition, it says any person with uh, a drop of non-white blood a mulatto, mestizo, uh, mixed race. I don't think they use the word mixed race. They use other words for that. Um, anybody who is non-white essentially cannot marry, cannot own property, cannot have access to the culture. So, but so exclusions based on supposed racial genotypes have existed since the colonial era. Uh, you know, and we still see the kind of the comedies. And you you, you look at uh, Downton Abbey, and you we we tut tut about how the British and the Irish carry on. Um, ra racialized prejudices are probably not na not specific to any particular kind of person. We're going to be talking about in my next issue of this is how it becomes in the United States apartheid, white apartheid. 
where it is put into law, where white Americans were given legally or socially sanctioned privileges. We just saw one in 1790. While these same rights were denied to other races and minorities. And if you want a very interesting study, took up uh, Haney's book called The Color of Law, or, or, in which he uh, basically talks about how different races uh, from Armenian to Asian to uh, even Middle East uh, went to court to argue that they were white. And in some cases, the Supreme Court found them white. In some places, the Supreme Court uh, denied it. In some places, the court found them white, then, then denied it later. So the issue of being white, even the, the, the 2010 census says, you know what, um, this isn't biology, it's custom usage. So Europeans, Amer European Americans, and my usual practices, I, I don't say African Americans unless I say European Americans. I will talk about black Americans, um, but to keep referring to African American without referring to European Americans is simply to set up the same binary that we're, we're basically trying to move away from. But uh, the European Americans enjoyed exclusive privileges in matters of education, immigration, voting rights, citizenship, land acquisition, and criminal procedure throughout American history. Um, you know, the, the, the issue of, of reparations for de descendants of uh, American slave, enslaved. Well, the point is like redlining, for example, did not check to see whether you were an enslaved person. Or not. It did check to see what your color was. And so the issue here about reparations is not simply who was enslaved in the country, but the, the color of the skin and the, the way this particular person was or was not permitted to become a citizen in the country. Non-Protestant immigrants from Europe, particularly Irish, Poles, and Italians, one of the reasons that, that Columbus Day was such a big deal, became, became such a big deal, because it was, and St. Patty's Day, was, was an attempt to try to develop a way into a social order that they were ex excluded from. My reference earlier about the, the, the Irish pub is to the point that if you were Irish uh, in 1840 and 1850, um, very often you would see sign uh, um, whites only beyond this point or black Irish need not apply. We know this. We may forget it, but we know it. And you know, John Kennedy becomes president or somebody else of some, some uh, ethnic majority or minority, and, you, know, you know, the first X, the first this, the first that. Often these persons suffered a xenophobic exclusion and other forms of ethnicity based discrimination. There, you know, the article, there's, I reference it later, uh, when Jews became white in, in the 1950s, there's a show, uh, Marvelous Ms. Maisel, for example. It, it, it's, it's not a seamless process in all of this, that uh, white is a, is a fantasy color, okay? It's not a color, it's a practice. Um, Madison Grant, uh, who channels uh, both Trump and, um, as we'll see later, Adolf Hitler. And this is the uh, Washington Post, White Nationalism's Deep American Roots, a long overdue excavation of the book that Hitler called his Bible and the man who wrote it. Uh, Madison Grant gives us the Untermensch via the Deutsch. It was his, it was his translation of the subhuman and the Germans translated it in their text as the Untermensch. By the way, uh, if you're a fan of American literature and you read uh, The Great Gatsby, uh, Tom Buchanan The Great Gatsby is going on and on and on about this particular book. He gets the title wrong, but he's basically using this as, as his uh, justification for why uh, Daisy and, and uh, what's his name, Gatsby, and all of those people, they should be put back in boats and, and shipped away. So he's referring, so uh, Fitzgerald refers to Grant's book. And this book is 1960. Uh, uh, I think it was 1921 is uh, Great Gatsby. Passing the Great Race and its translation, Die Untergang der Großen Rasse by uh, then Monson Grant. Okay. Another one of the same time. And it, you know, your grandparents and our grandparents will understand the breeding and the eugenics and the immigration will all become all part of the one fantasy, a calculus of racial purity. The enemy without, the enemy within, and if you know your, your, your great grandparents may possibly have had marriage uh, law, marriage certificates that said that they were ethnically clean. Um, this I'm not making this stuff up. You can Google it yourself. And the, the PBS has a wonderful special on uh, American uh, eugenics. It's um, all this stuff is horrible to think about, but as a matter of fact, it's it's what shapes this particular country. Um, and Madison Grant writes this. You can kind of see the different kinds of persons here. Um, 
not only uh, African indigene, but uh, Asian. Okay. Again, Washington Post, Trump's xenophobia is an American tradition, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, this particular um, uh, badly grammar, grammatized note is from uh, Texas. I love it because of its poor grammar. Um, no Spanish or Americans. Another issue of persons who were dropped out, you probably didn't know that a third of a uh, Mexican population of California was, uh, they call it repatriated, um, but uh, expelled from California in the, in the 20s, late 20s and 30s. Um, they were citizens. Okay, 20 percent of the entire Mexican and Mexican American population in the U.S. expelled from California. California, I think it was in 60 or 70, came up with an apology for this. Um, Mexicans in 1924 are really the only uh, external race that are given a pass into the country if they pay a $10 tax. Because, as the uh, founder of the bill said, well, but they, because we need them to do our work. So, um, white does a job. It's not a practice. I mean, it's not a color. It's a practice. It's how we do it. So, we need to ask ourselves what is white good for? What is it useful for? Um, referencing the 19th century and increasingly the progressive era, labor unrest, white apartheid moves to include a new white emphasis in nativism. Um, white apartheid, it's not white segregation, it's by law. And we'll begin to see that increasingly. Uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, and we'll see this in 1924, the New Virginia Racial Purity Act, that, that's its name, Chinese, Japanese, Japs. Um, Thomas Nash's wonderful work. Late as 1924, the new Virginia law to preserve racial integrity, as if any of this could, at this particular point, if any one of this could be, if there were, ever was an originary racial integrity, we don't have it. Provided that white persons were defined as those with, quote, no trace whatsoever of any blood other than Caucasian, if you look up Caucasian, you find that it's a discredited biological definition. Blumenbach, Frederick Blumenbach in 1795, which talks about the most beautiful people are the people from the Caucasians. Or quote, one sixteenth or one less of the blood of American Indian. March of 1924. Same year, same state. And I'm sorry to say that Virginia doesn't really, uh, doesn't come out well in a lot of this. It's making up for it now, possibly, but same year, same state, the social practice that shapes the law. So that law and practice go back and forth at the Anglo-Saxon Club to meet tomorrow. Colleges and rest schools in Virginia plan to send representatives to Richmond, okay, founded to basically keep white supremacists in education and intelligence, selection, and exclusion of immigrants. Um, in 1967, Prince Edwards County closed its public schools rather than desegregate. In 2005, Virginia finally uh, ended up with an apology and scholarships for those that it affected. So the, the question one particular asks, um, since 1400s, there has been this, this notion or fantasy of blood and uh, the quasi as to cure the purity of the blood. Obama is always a black president. He's never mixed race. Why is that? That's more politics. The fact, because as a matter of fact, uh, he has two parents, and actually, um, his through his mother, through his white mother, his defined white mother, he has the genetic makeup of the first person technically named a slave in Virginia law. It's a wonderful fact, and you probably don't know that, or maybe you do, um, but that he is connected to John Punch in 1636. Um, through his, quote, white mother, who, uh, uh, Ann Dunham in, in Kansas. Um, so the one drop rule becomes the law of the land a half century after enslavement has ended. Um, Plessy versus Ferguson, the VA Virginia purity, I think we know this. So, so, so there you have it. You have on the books from 1790 until at least 1952, laws that require whiteness as a condition for immigration and naturalization. The U.S. was legally required to be, at least through the mid-19th century, designed to be white. 
whatever it might be now, whatever our HR people are telling us uh, and whatever our media is telling us about celebrating diversity, whatever it, it might be now, it was not even in very reasonable, very recent previous eras designed to be an experiment in racial diversity. I teach a course on European ethics, which is essentially what all of us take when the, 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 intro, the intro to ethics, intro to philosophy, colonial to ethics for most of us was the European colonial, uh, ah, sorry, the European uh, continental tradition. And every school I've ever taught it, I go, you know what, let's save the statues perhaps, but throw away the, 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 the curriculum because that's what needs to be changed. So the melting pot, so-called, included only Europeans. But then again, um, you think that by 70, from 1790 through uh, 1924, we've learned something, but the 24 Immigration and Exclusion Act, the sponsor said he was acting to protect people born here. David Reed, the bill's sponsor, tells the Senate that earlier legislation, quote, disregards entirely those of us who are interested in keeping American stock up to the highest standard, that is the people who were born here. Does that include the 8.8 .8 million black Americans born in the US, some with history of enslavement? Uh, and the use of this word, of course, should remind us of the stock market, should remind us of uh, the, the, the stock forms, it should remind us of all that kind of um, money, money for bodies stuff, and why we don't want to put Harriet Tubman on a $20 bill. Um, so that's part of that. So this cartoon by Nash, what happened to the one we, we used to have. More on this later. So it's clear that racial purity is cultural specific, that the code words that Jefferson were using, that Bloomblock was using, that Reed was using, that all these folks were using, that Hammond was using, uh, that they might be talking race, 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 but they meant competency, 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 and it's about dominion. Race could never be a matter of physiology, cultural competency. Parenting styles, domestic arrangements, moral environment are crucial to defining who was considered European. And this is a, from a 1993 issue from uh, the city paper, uh, not the city paper, the, the New York paper. The white issue, Jews are not white. And um, the, the Jewish, and then there's another issue on that one um, from Jewish currents. When did Jews become white? Um, it's, 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 it's fascinating biology and fascinating philosophy. So the, the fantasy, of course, is still in play. The consequences of these early steps to control and define the shape and culture of a new nation, legal, political, and social, and we live with today. And, you know, it's easy in our places to have the, the I guess, called the white privilege of CNN. Um, and <clears throat> we don't have to pay attention to the cages that what we see in the and the attempts to keep people out and what we do with them and um, the stock markets, if you want, on that. Ms. Targaryen probably would. She'd understand 1,500 years of white dominion for their own good. Um, take up the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed. Go send your sons to exile to serve your captives need. To wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild. Your new caught sullen peoples, half devil, half child, take up the white man's burden, have done with childish days. The lightly preferred laurel that easy, ungrudging praise comes now to search your manhood. Uh, Richard Kipling addressed the white man's burden of the United States and the Philippine Islands in 1899, to which respond, uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas, uh, to which report Mark Twain says, does the race of the United States love a lord? So by 1899, it was pretty clear that the United States was in the um, mode of empire. And, and by the way, one wonders why Game of Thrones was, is, is so endlessly fascinating because you can see it. It continues a fantasy and you show me how someone's fantasy and we'll show you the prison that they find themselves trapped in. So still making America white. White's not a color. It's a practice. And by the way, Aryan usually is completely misread. I mean, the Aryan persons generally tend to be high Middle East Aryan, uh, so it would be kind of the ant ant ancestors of, of the um, Asian or Indian. 
So, so a legal apartheid, we'll talk about this more next time, is designed for white separation. So it's not black segregation as much is the point, it's white segregation. So when Wilkerson talks about encased, uh, she talks about the exogamous marriage is that keeping races from marrying keeps them in their place, each on each other one. So it's a necessary corollary, corollary to colonialism. On one hand, we're gonna go in as settler colonists and eliminate because we have no intention, we had no intention of taking care of the Native Americans, we had no intention of taking care of the Arawak, we had no intention of, of sharing this land. And you, you see this from Thomas Jefferson through George Washington. Um, George Washington, who was the general in charge of, as he said, exterminate. You have um, Je Jeffrey Amherst, who gives us Amherst College, and we know it and we love it. Um, he was the one who was sending poison blankets into the Indian camps to kill them. And, and he, uh, Andrew Jackson was known as the Indian killer. That's how he got his job as a, in the White House. Um, so back to Manifest Destiny, back to the Declaration of Independence, and you've heard me talk about this a couple of different times. It takes, it takes more reading than we're gonna do it right over here. Uh, this is a draft, <clears throat> and in his first draft, he tends to be fairly vigorous about uh, in, enslavement. And what we need to understand is, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have us. This is where the we hold these rights to be self-evident, right? So life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It refers back to this particular line. It justifies this line. It has nothing to do with the fact that Thomas Jefferson was sleeping with a 14-year-old enslaved half-sister of his wife, and that he had five eventually um, mixed-race children with him, none of whom he acknowledged or freed. Nothing to do with human rights in that particular sense. In the first draft, when it talks specifically about enslavement, uh, it's later rewritten. He has excited domestic insurrections among us. And by that, we're referring specifically to the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which basically says, okay, these are where the native Indian nations have their homes. Uh, this is where the colony has its homes. You shall not cross this. So when Jefferson starts going on here about endeavor to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of ages, sexes, and conditions of existence. Well, really, he's talking about how the colonialists um, take care of their people. And there are something like 485 uh, individual treaties made with Indian nations, all of which have been violated in some kind of way. So it's the, what we never hear talked about is the, uh, the he here, the use of the pronoun, hides the fact that probably the first uh, really uh, legal pronouncement about indigene in the, in the quote, the new world. And to this day, Canadian First Peoples use that uh, 1873 proclamation as an indication, even with the UN, that they have rights, legal rights. Um, <clears throat> Dr. King, why we can't wait, I'm gonna read this. Our nation was born in genocide when it embraced the doctrine that the original American, or the Indian, was an inferior race. Even before there were large numbers of Negroes on our shore, the scar of racial hatred had already disfigured colonial society. From the 16th century forward, blood flowed in battles of racial supremacy. This is in 1963, and the word genocide is probably not used again until the, until the UN. We are perhaps the only nation which has tried as a matter of national policy to wipe out its indigenous population. Moreover, we elevated the tragic experience into a noble crusade. Indeed, today we have not permitted ourselves to reject or feel remorse for the shameful episode. Our literature, our films, our drama, our folklore, all exalted. Even uh, President Bush and on 9-11 will use the images of the Western. Bring them in, dead or alive. Uh, Geronimo country. Geronimo was the um, buzzword for uh, the killing of uh, bin Laden. Very quickly, uh, so we're talking here about social practices hidden in plain sight. The 1860 American Colonization Society creating a black reservation in the West. 1862, Lincolnia in Panama, a place to relocate black Americans. The object here was to remove these persons and to move them away not because we were taking care of them, 
but because as a matter of fact, it made it easier once they were gone that enslaved persons could stay enslaved. Uh, some comment, black activist James Fortin writes in 1817, we have no wish to separate from our present homes for any purpose whatsoever. Frederick Douglass, shame upon the guilty wretches that dare propose and all that countenance such a proposition. I love Douglas. He was smarter than most people writing about him. We live here, have lived here, have a right to live here, and mean to live here. And Lincoln, being you know a, a person of his own time, was <clears throat> basically called in um, black leaders and said, "Well, so um, we can give you three hundred dollars per person if you will immigrate to to Liberia, your homeland." And that's when they all said, "Well, this is our homeland." Um, this is an aside. This is the map of Liberia, which was bought in 1816 as a home for the liberated. You'll notice here that it has republics of Maryland, other state-sponsored colonies through here. There's Pennsylvania, there's Mississippi, there's Maryland. They're, they're already planning to move black Americans, uh, deport in the same way that they've been deported the Mexicans to another country. So since, and I'll point out again here, is something I've said before, since at least the, probably the 17th century, most enslaved blacks were born here and by Jusoli are citizens. The land to paraphrase Robert Frost was and remains their home. To send them any place else is not to send them back to their homeland. Uh, and white only, it's not just a Southern problem. Okay? This is Oregon. It's not just then. This is an Uber ad, I mean a VRBO ad. A strong vein of national amnesia when it comes to recent declamations about Asian. Uh, I, th I think very often we tend to forget how we have treated persons of an Asian extraction through much of the 19th and early 20th century. Um, for those who know anything about Washington DC as an enslaved kind of enclave, it is surrounded by towns, Chevy Chase is one of them, that all around the border that we would call sundown towns, which meant to be said that if you were a black American, you could not be found in that town after sundown. Um, Google it sometime, look it up, and you've got, uh, you, have, you have the town, you have Chevy Chase, you have Silver Spring, you have uh, a number of the towns, uh, when, you go, when you go beyond that, all the way around, that essentially will keep, uh, black Americans in Washington, D.C. This was Michigan in 1943. This is Texas, the early 50s. This was Chevy Chase until the 60s. Uh, if you know where Lord and Taylor is in Chevy Chase, for those who are, who are, local, who are local, that whole area was bought by someone who wanted to make uh, affordable housing for, for black Americans, uh, and the city wouldn't let them do it, so it stayed empty for years. So the, the function of white, not a color, it's a strategy. It's a verb, to white out, what it looks like in theory. <clears throat> the citizens of Alabama declare for white supremacy and purity of ballot. Um, I, I, I can hardly read this. The putrid sore of Negro suffrage is severed from the body politic of the Commonwealth. <clears throat> the, both the, the description and the violence on the front page of a newspaper. What the work of white looks like in law and how law confirms social practice. The Constitutional Convention in 1901 in Alabama, quote, was called with the intention by Democrats of the state, quote, within the limits imposed by the federal constitution to establish white supremacy in this state. North Carolina, who gives us the Wilmington coup in 1896, about which is important to understand that that's probably the first time that the word coup is ever mentioned when white people uh, walk in, uh, basically shoot to death the elected black officials, more than one, and uh, assume, the, assume the roles of the government. North Carolina is a white man's state and white men will rule it, I guess women too, supposedly. And they will crush the party of Negro domination beneath a majority so overwhelming that no other party will ever dare to attempt to establish Negro rule here. 1898, the Caucasian. 
So still making America white again. You see this constant emphasis on it just doesn't happen at once. You have to keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it again. 20th century and the invention of the lost cause. Um, the protocols of whiteness, and there's a kind of a pun here, maybe a bad one on the protocols of Zion, which was a different uh, technique and a different way of establishing uh, dynamics of power and a different way of repudiating a different population of persons. Uh, Francis Ansley, by white supremacy, I do not mean to allude only to the self-conscious racism of white supremacist hate groups. They're the easy ones to talk about. I refer instead to a political, economic, and cultural system in which whites overwhelmingly control power and material resources. Again, the conversation around and uh, Mr. Tanahasi Coates in uh, his 2014 essay talks about 250 years of enslavement, 150 years of Jim Crow. And everyone says, well, but uh, you know, my, my grandparents weren't, weren't enslaved. Why should I have, why should I be part of reparations? Um, because again, redlining and social laws and real estate and banking and mortgages uh, and inheritance laws and other kinds of laws did not just check, check it, it wasn't like a vaccine. You didn't have a passport. You didn't look at it and say, oh, so you were enslaved. Um, they would tell by your skin color. Ideas of white supremacy, superiority and entitlement are widespread and relations of white dominance and non-white subordination are daily reenacted across a broad array of institutions and social settings. So, and what does white make possible? It clearly makes possible the necessary enemy. Um, if we're going to be talking a little bit here about American policing, uh, we'll remember that in 1704 was the first, I want to call it, they weren't police, they were more vigilante, armed vigilante groups in South Carolina that were slave patrols. So it was the, the first police that emerged from that kind of urban um, uh, surveillance would have been in Boston in 1830. Um, but police are, as this, uh, this particular article, Police are a reflection of society. We do not have a police officer free so we can pick police from who are immune to racism. And the Brennan Report, which is something and I will simply quote to you right now, ought to be read, looks at this and, and, and talks about race and white supremacy in policing. Since 2000, law enforcement officials with alleged connections to white supremacist groups or far right militant activities have been exposed in Alabama, California, Connecticut, Florida, Illinois, Louisiana, Michigan, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Oregon, Texas, Virginia, Washington, West Virginia, and elsewhere. And it's called the Brennan Report on Police. You can find that. So we begin to look at here kind of the changing face of American white supremacy. And it's, it's clear we have moved away from a simple definition of white and black, because now if these terms had any kind of meaning, there's a kind of a crystallization, just as uh, in 1705, when you ask somebody, where are you, who are you? I'm an Englishman, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. Um, as Alan says, by, by, by 1670, 1680, you were no longer saying that, you were, you were using uh, slave or unslave, where white then becomes the term of access. Um, in terms of, this, of the Spanish and the Latin American tradition, you had, the, you had white, brown, and black. You had white would have been the, the Spanish uh, colonists who would have had brown, who would have been um, persons who were mixed blood, mestiza, and then you would have black who would have been the African or the, or the black slaves that were taken in. Um, from the center on extremism, Violence and crime represent the most serious problems emanating from the white supremacist movement. White supremacists have killed more people in recent years than any other type of domestic extremist. 54% of all bullet related murders in the past 10 years. And the point is, is that if you started, they say that if you, if you took a look at, say, uh, I looked at this last week in my, uh, on, on Rise, if you looked at black activism and black extremism, you see nowhere near the kinds of numbers that you do here uh, because these go under, under, basically under the radar. They're also a troubling source of domestic terror incidences, including 13 plots or attacks within the past five years. And 
if you stop and think about it, folks, we, we can each remember back to, I think it was 1998, was at the Murrah building. We, we, know, we, we know others. Um, on 90, uh, June 6th, January 6th this year, we'll be talk about that in just a second. So, so but, but the kind of, you know, hate that is beginning to, and you, you can't really say that it's race or that it's religious, but that these become metaphors by which it can be in particularly included. So uh, David Lane's the 14 words, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. In 1988, David Lane's White Genesis Manifesto, let those who commit treason with a Zionist destroyer. You know, um, we, never, we never did lose, Ford never did lose his, uh, his energy around uh, with, the, with the, the protocols of Zion. If we are successful in our goal, expressed in the 14 words, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. Then your treachery will be appropriately rewarded. If not, and the white race goes the way of the dinosaurs, then the last generation of white children, including yours, will pay for their vile complicity at the hands of the colored races who will inherit the world. Uh, this is not new language. We heard this with uh, Lothrop Stoddard. We heard this with Grant. We, we, saw this in, we saw this at the turn of the century. Um, you saw this kind of language as early as in the pre-Confederacy. Pre you have this kind of language in Jefferson's uh, um, Notes on the State of Virginia. We, he talks about these, these two. You, I said it last week, and for those who heard my last presentation, if you go to the, to the monument, Jefferson's Monument, there's one panel that says, you know, in the book of nature, both races deserve to be free. Well, yes, but then he also then says, but we can't do that because one race will kill the other. That's a paraphrase, but you can, he uses the word exterminate. Uh, so there is this particular notion uh, that it wraps itself around and it's not so much, uh, you know, it's the volt, it's the Deus Volt, it's the Holy War. It's some kind of paradigmatic cultural thing that somehow is typified by, by race and it goes back to Shakespeare's Otello in 1611 and these, these people who look differently than us. It's not so much that they look differently than us that they are racially or, or, or are not culturally competent. Um, just for showing, White supremacists, separatist groups. What you see here is half the list. Half. Here's a map. California. 57. What do you think? Pennsylvania, 38. New York, 44. According to Southern Poverty Law Center, which tracks hate crimes, hate groups, currently 930 hate groups, the number of groups increasing as opposed to decreasing. In 2000, there were only 602, 194 militia or patriot groups. Um, you know, a different topic, of course, the NRA, the National Rifle Association, has been hijacked, you know, to use that particular language, by all of this too. Um, so the language that we use around guns and community also gets mixed up into this. In 2008, the number of militia and, and patriot groups dropped to 149. But as soon as Obama was elected, the number jumped to over 1,000. I don't have a lot of answers to this. I'm simply laying out factoids as they come out. And one can begin to see that there are, there are questions here. Uh, one of the things I want to point out over here uh, the, um, the, the, sorry, the burning of the cross was not an initial one of the, you can say that the Ku Klux Klan had three particular episodes. First uh, in the 1860s, where it was kind of, uh, kind of a, a white redeemer nation where it was controlling um, uh, boundaries for the former enslaved. Then there was one at the turn of the century. And then there was the 1920, 25 uh, reticrescence of the which became more focused on immigration and, and basically on Catholics of all things. But the burning of the cross was more one of the later two, because by this time, religion itself was becoming the vehicle of this. Uh, the, the Economists, why white nationalist terrorism is a global threat. We, we spend a great deal of time uh, perseverating around Islamic kind of ISIS and this, that and the other thing. Um, and, 
perhaps with all gentleness, we should be paying attention to the other side of the of this particular cultural divide. That is, there there is clearly energy around here, um, and that, that is violent. That that is destructive. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it's so much about race. Is it about uh, who controls things? Is it about the, the, the dominance? Is it about uh, and people talk about a certain kind of persons who are favored now or are usually white males and they're they're underprivileged and this and that and everything. Um, <clears throat> it, it might be a lack of resources and it might be a, a feeling of so much of the rhetoric that I hear through this seems to be an anxiousness of ownership. <coughs> Sorry. Interesting here to look at um, an early map of the what they call the Northwest, Northwest National Imperative. This was, and as early as the 1870s, this became an area where white persons, again, remember the 1859 Constitution of Oregon, basically explicitly stated that no free Negro mulatto or Indian could be a member of the state. So for the last 150 years, this has been an area, partly because it's geographically distant, you remember Waco, you remember the different places uh, where this was going to be the white ethno state, the enclave, at the same time that this was going to be the Republic of New Africa for the same particular reason. But, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a white separatist neo-Nazi idea, um, but Nazism, as we will see, is less native to Deutschland, to Germany, than it is to the U.S., and we'll see that in a moment. It's been popularized since the 1970s and 80s by white nationalist supremacist and white separatist groups within the U.S. Um, I am fairly certain that you know the, the 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 questions and the energies and the discussions around vaccinating and not vaccinating are, are are ancillary conversations here, because even when you come back to the lost cause and the and the, the Confederacy, the issue here was not as much for them enslavement but states' rights, what we could do and what we could not do. So, um, Proud Boys and the White Ethno State, Ms. Stern's book, how the alt-right is warping the American imagination. And the alt-right is a term that we first began to hear in the 1970s with the recrudescence then of civil rights. Yeah. White, by God. The Church of Jesus Christ, Christian, would you know that that's a very famous white separatist church? And this is not, we don't have time for this today, but this is again in another series, I, I, I talk about this, uh, basically looking at how Jesus came to resemble a white European. And here you see Raphael's The Transfiguration, where this is clearly uh, a person not of the Mideast persuasion. He was, well, he looks like he could be British or maybe Scotch. So. But to return to where we started, Christianity, colonial, colonialism, and the meaning of money. Uh, the Christians, and I probably should say low C with a small C in America, may not always acknowledge how influential the Klan was or, or how the group made strong connections between faith and racial purity. And again, not the first group so much. The first Klan was kind of, you know, five guys sitting around drinking, playing poker, and deciding to dress up and, and you know, because, because they could. It was the third group where they were wearing the outfits because they could get away with a lot underneath those outfits. They could do that kind of closet terrorism without identifying themselves. Religion remains a prominent part of the Klan, though many pretended not. Dr. Swift's Church of Jesus Christ, Christian. Uh, here in the corner here, you see a 1925 image of Jesus handing out the tenets, I won't say the tenets of whiteness, but the tenets of the Ku Klux Klan. And this is about when you started finding out. Um, so if there's an archaeology of the Klan, and there is, by the time you get to the third one, you, you now have a well-oiled protocol and a mechanism by which the, the cross is now part of that. So um, it gets murky here because I mean, you, you can, off the top of your head, you can probably think of six or seven or eight uh, church or synagogue related killings that were white supremacist, Christian identity is racist and anti-Semitic, white supremacist interpretations of Christianity hold that only German, Anglo-Saxon, Celtic, Nordic, Aryan people, and they usually misuse Aryan, 
and those of kindred blood are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and hence descendants of the ancient Israelites. The Mormon practice of this is itself very interesting because the, the lost tribes of Israel become the founding tribes of Mormonism. Uh, for the Confederacy, for example, as I said, the pre-Adamites, um, what they are saying over here is that polygenesis gives the South its excuse for enslavement because um, the Adam and Eve, white people, clearly from the Bible, uh, were the ones having dominion, but it was the pre-Adamites, those persons who were hiding over here on, underneath the trees, uh, who, as Jan Christen said, well, they might be people, but they're, but they're not us. So that Christian identity itself as a, as a name of a religion holds that non-whites, people not wholly European descent, will either be exterminated or enslaved in order to serve the white race in the new heavenly kingdom of earth under the reign of Jesus Christ. Um, there's you it, it doesn't get pleasant but they call them mud people they talk about intercourse between uh apes and 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 other persons and so you have a uh, that that black people persons of color uh and, and jews for example or what they call mud people uh, perhaps a slur at uh, darwin's evolution perhaps a slur at the, the pre-adamites but people who were born created outside of the garden of eden in order to try to make for the Confederacy it was very important because they weren't um, they weren't really paying attention to the science as much as they were to the the, the fundamentalism of the Bible itself that the Bible itself gave them their answer and that they had to figure a way to read the book of Genesis as establishing Adam and Eve and if that's the case then where did these other persons come from okay W. Du Bois is his expression on the left, 1906, the religion of white supremacy in the United States. Proud to be white, contact like-minded people. Um, we have a few more minutes here. I'm not going to be. Uh, I'm going to be. Oops, sorry. What did I do? Go back up. So Christian identity is a political theology that becomes important in the 80s and 90s and still around. It's the idea that white people are the true chosen people that everyone else, all races and ethnicities, are descended either from Satan or from animals. The doctrines differ on this particular point. Um, the synagogue, for example, in New Zealand, uh, and that killing was of a Christian identity, where that these persons, not European persons, were, were mud people. And it's, it's, it's very similar to kinds of broader evangelical grounds for, of the 1980s not just on the far fringe, but mainstream conservative circles. What it does is transform the entire political and ideological belief system around white reproduction into a holy war. And now you come back to the Supreme Court and abortion rights. Because um, part of the conversation here is that the number of white people matters. So if you're driving up and down 95, if you go through Connecticut and New Jersey, of all places, you will see signs on both sides of billboards on both sides of 95, um, which talk about uh, white babies and, and Jesus. And you're kind of wondering, this seems to me to be an odd place for this. Because now it's a project of faith for those who take up arms and engage in race war. So here we are, we're still trying to make America white again, and it has never been white ever. Um, the legal process started a long time ago. First in Virginia in law in 1705, because Virginia is the first time that the word white is used and the law says all non-white persons, mulattoes, mestizos, blacks, um, and there's another word that it uses, are real estate. That's the word in the law, are real estate. The first time was the first naturalization and immigration act, free white aliens, free white persons that it wasn't enough to be white. You had to be a free white person. And that gets into, in that particular time, it got into the, to the Cromwellian and the Irish and British wars. But the, the point was, is that not even white persons were entitled to naturalization. And blacks were not the only person at risk. So um, I want you to look here. You got Zane Gray's The Vanishing American. You've got the vanishing American, the decline and fall of the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Um, 
Jared Taylor again of the influential white nationalist website, American Renaissance, which under the guise of race realism attempts to put an intellectual face on white nationalism. These are some of the images that you see. We've seen, we saw this one earlier, Japs keep moving, this is a white man's neighborhood. Um, Woodrow Wilson and Jefferson, it astonishes me who lived in DC, how, how f there seem to be no other names that we can use for bridges and for schools than Wilson and Jefferson. Um, I made a quick little quib in, in the uh, trans, uh, transatlantic one. If we're, going to, if we're going to talk about removing and changing names of the slaveholders, what are we going to do with New York? I mean, it was the Duke of York uh, related to the current uh, royal person, by the way, um, who founded and brought 90,000 black slaves into New York, and which built its stock market. And stock market there does not mean money. It means stockade. It means stocks. It means uh, like cattle, chattel. The concept of white genocide, extinction under an onslaught of genetically or culturally inferior non-white interlopers, seems at first a fringe conspiracy theory with an alien lineage. The province of neo-Nazis or similar, and again, we keep using the expression neo-Nazi, but I keep, every time I use it, I want to point out that we're using a shorthand that really isn't accurate, that the Nazis got their ideas, uh, sorry to say it, from us. I'll point that out in a minute. So the Supreme Court in Texas, the other excess facet of genocide, reproduction, the point of gender division in a political economy. It's not just about being freedom. It's just about who's doing the work and how much they're getting paid for it. We know this. Uh, women understand this much better than men do. Um, women understand that when you read a book and that they have to do the work of translating, that men, that it's all, Thomas Jefferson, all men are created equal. We know, we know, we have to keep rereading it, rereading it, rereading it. Uh, in this case too, that, um, you know, get, get these laws off my body. Well, the laws are on the body for a particular reason of, and that do not actually favor women. Women in this movement serve a really important symbolic role. For many activists in the white power movement, it comes down to preservation of the race through the reproduction of the white children. It's very interesting when trying to, in the, uh, when the rise of the lost cause of the Confederacy in the end of the 19th century, uh, about 40 years after uh, the Civil War ended, it was mostly driven and remains mostly driven by the daughters of the, of the Confederacy. It's, it's women-centric who pushes that particular burden. And we'll see that here in another case. And so opposing immigration in the white power movement had to do with the number of white babies versus the number of other babies. So similarly, opposing abortion, opposing gay rights, opposing feminism in white power Discourse. All of this is tied to reproduction and the birth of white children. Well, I guess how Pete Buttigieg and, and uh, his husband, uh, Justine, um, they are now contributing. They're, they're part of the work. The, um, the, the, the eco uh, Eco-philosopher eco on my point says, well, after 2050, whether we have a world to have all these things to begin with will depend on how we'll begin to take care of it now. Here's what I meant earlier in terms of uh, you will not replace us. This notion of there's a kind of anxiety that translates, and there's a book that I actually had on here called Searching for the White Utopia, um, that it does translate into uh, my husband's uh, family is all from Missouri, and, and even he points out, he says, how can, um, they're voting for a, a, a kind of politic that the first thing that it does is take away their health care, take away the, the, the amount of money that they make, um, take away any kind of security that they might have. Uh, how do we get them to do that? And that I go back to Karl Marx on this, that the, 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 the strongest power a nation has, or a colonialist has, is by making the colonized understand and value the name it's given so that we do the work for the enemy ourselves. So alt-right again comes from the 70s and uh, this kind of this white power when you, we first heard it, as I said, when we started talking about civil rights more prominently. And you can begin to see the various kinds of ways that uh, we are aping a kind of neo-Nazi 
and we're wondering, where do we see all this? So that the new face of white supremacy, it goes beyond systemic racism, non-whites by law face in the United States, by law. It's not just get off the, off the street or I'll, I'll, I'll hit you. There are legal things in place by which persons do not have the same or equal access to various parts. White supremacists dream of a world in which minorities are either subservient or non-existent. Settler colonialism, our own founding logic, demands elimination. Manifest destiny. This land is our land. Thank you, Woody Guthrie. Thank you, Robert Frost. It's not our land. Okay. Uh, even international law, incommensurability. So, well, if, uh, if a law comes into a land and the, and the first law there is incommensurable with the second, then the second law becomes the one that governs. So, America has been invaded. The city becomes a serious menace to our civilization. It's a peculiar attraction to the immigrant. So this is from the America First. As such, America's legal immigration system should be curtailed to those that can contribute not only economically, but have demonstrated respect for this nation's culture and rule of law. Uh, I always laugh when I think about this culture and rule of law because I don't know that we have one. Um, the state of Jefferson, how interesting. We're we'll, gonna come back to that here in a moment. Same tune, of course, different singer. They don't have any good new ideas. Um, sometime look up the 2005, 2010 census and it's kind of a, it's apologia for what, uh, what it means by race. It's kind of lame, but it says, well, you know, you know, really there's no biological basis of this and it, it's, it's only what it's convention and the Supreme Court every 10 years kept changing his mind on whether this group or that group, whether they're Asian or Middle East or were, was citizens or whether they were white or whether they weren't white. So Northwest Territory in the state of Jefferson. So you see here that, uh, and again, this has little to do, I think, initially with race. It's not to function that way. But again, here's this man, Jefferson, who keep coming in, um, that Oregon and some California counties are going to be the 51st state of Jefferson. This is not a new idea. It goes back to 1870. Um, but it becomes a, a way in which a lot of other kinds of notions become added onto it including racism and the neo-Nazis and the state of the of Jefferson Proud Boys and the Don't Tread on Me, which is, a, is a, 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 an early U.S. kind of thing. I have my rights. Yeah. And going back to the Oregon Constitution in 1858, Oregon, one of the whitest states in the country and originally by design. Okay. The objective was spurred by the U.S. Congress's 1850 Oregon Donation Land Act, which granted land for free to every white settler in the Oregon Territory and explicitly excluded people of color. Not unusual, the, um, the Homesteading Act did the same sort of thing. No Negro or mulatto shall have the right of entry. 1858, Oregon Constitution. The issue here, for my days, is not so much the protesting, but the photo op. I, am, I hesitate to say it. Uh, why is this gendered this particular way? I don't know that the, the groups over which we're talking about are really so good on gender, actually. Caught on the cross here, and then you have the cross. My suspicions are that a lot of this is media driven and there are kilometers, kilometers of work. The, um, the recent uh, uh, movements around abortion, the recent movements around, um, around voting acts, it's very important to vote. It's very important to have a competent Supreme Court. It's clearly evident that, that a cultural order um, is being, I wouldn't say moved away from us, but there is a kind of a sense of, there's a shift happening politically and nationally, and the code words are race and religion and, and abortion. The Trump movement has never been about populism or nationalism or interests of working Americans. 
it's always been about the contours of our national community, who belongs, who doesn't, who counts, who shouldn't, who can wield power, who must be subjected to it. And the president's defenders, whatever else they might say, race at the core, even if it is made up. Trump will have support for anyone who wants to give it to him, but the Americans that matter are the white ones and of them only a subset. A couple images here that some of you may have seen before. Here's the immigration cages, 2018, El Paso, Texas. El Paso, Texas, 1920, 100 years ago. Immigration agents spraying Mexican immigrants with Zyklon B. Yes, Zyklon B. A German chemical producer used his first trial of Zyklon B to perfect the later lethal dose of Zyklon B used in Auschwitz and Birkenau. Uh, an image I won't spend much time on, but part of the consequences that we face of persons who have a fantasy of life and what involved in that. So as I, as I come to, to an end here, I'm going to say, where have we seen all of this before? Behind every act of violence, there is a word that provides a rationale. I'll go all the way back up to January 6th, 2021. We'll have no Jews seen in our neighborhood. This was Heydrich's letter from the Wannsee Conference in 1944-42 about the final solution of the Jewish problem, quote, quote. A, 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 an, an image that they took from the Congress's note about the final solution to the Indian problem in 1878. The so-called New World. Converging influences that governed the United States policy of race-based legal apartheid. That same ideology made possible a different form of manifest destiny, the final solution. And again, I point out that that expression is not Nazi, it's English, it's, it's our Congress. The final solution to the Indian problem uh, when they were trying to build the intercontinental train, train across the country. So the United States and the making of Nazi race law, Hitler's American model. Uh, Adolf Hitler tells the New York Times a year before becoming chancellor, it was America that taught us a nation should not open its doors equally to all nations. Hitler plays close attention to politics, again in Mein Kampf. I have studied with great interest the laws of America concerning prevention of reproduction by people whose progeny would in all probability be of no value or be injurious to the racial stock. In 1927, the Supreme Court, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, echoes Hitler in the majority decision when he says three generations of imbecility are enough. And he, he verifies that Supreme, that Virginia can in fact, um, take its persons and sterilize them in, in, um, in their rental homes. So here on the left, you see uh, Hitler and his comrades, including Rudolf S, during their imprisonment at Landsberg after the failed putsch. Again, Mein Kampf. It's a big book. He was in jail for five years. He had nothing else to do. Hitler writes that racial hygiene one day, quote, will appear as a deed greater than the most victorious wars of a present bourgeois era. For men do not perish as a result of lost wars, but by the loss of pure blood. Quote I just read, America taught us a nation should not open its doors. Elsewhere, he admiringly notes, the US simply excluded the immigration of certain races. In these respects, America already pays obeisance, at least in tentative first steps, to the characteristic Volkish conception of the state. Hitler and his followers were eager to claim a foreign American lineage for the Nazi mission. Madison Grant's work, The Passing the Great Race, provided Hitler's confirmation, as did Henry Ford. Uh, Henry Ford marked, uh, uh, Trump was at Henry Ford's, uh, the, the Ford um, uh, automobile, just uh, two years ago, I think, and he, he talked about the, the CEO who was that some relation to the, to the Ford. Yes, he has got good blood. I went to myself, hmm, Trump should, should be paying more attention to what he's reading. 
this is simply three or four slides about the relationship, but when you go step by step and you see the Alien and Sedition Act, which is picked up into the Nazi laws, uh, the Nuremberg laws, you begin to see when you see that uh, at, at Nuremberg, the, um, the defense quotes Oliver Wendell Holmes Supreme Court 27 decision it, 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 to, to actually uh, impress upon the jurors and the judges that Nazi Germany was not doing anything that America had not done itself. So we're going we're to end here in a minute uh, about, again, the space ledger and the age-old problem of blaming the Jews with the notion of um, this kind of focused laser attack on other people, other peoples, whether it's the medieval, you know, they're, they're baby killers or they're baby eaters or they're doing this or they're doing that. Uh, what exactly is, is beneath it? I don't necessarily know. But that race is real politic. Even if it is invented biology, it's fantasy built a country. And it still profits us. This is the uh, white by law by Henny Lopez that I mentioned earlier. Um, oh, and by the way, there are two irons here. The Statue of Liberty in 1886 was given to us as a Statue of Freedom. The model for this was an Algerian black woman. Or, Statue of Liberty was created to celebrate free slaves by a French abolitionist, not immigrants. Who knew, right? If you look at the feet of the Statue of Liberty, you see the chains broken. The Statue of Liberty is not about immigration. It was about liberty and abolition. I want to thank you for uh, what is um, a difficult topic to walk through, and much of it is left on the floor. There's a few things that we can t we put together here. The next time I come back to the topic, I want to come back to the laws and the social practices of U.S. white apartheid. My, my point again here is that it's not just social practice, it's written into law. And it's the laws that when you hear people talking about the United Nations in 2016 calls on the United States <clears throat> uh, for reparative justice, restorative justice, it's the laws that they are talking about that govern not, not just formerly enslaved black Americans who were born here, but from 1865 through 1957, 65, uh, when black citizens um, in a variety of ways were, were kept legally from access to education, property, place, and geography. I, I thank you for coming along this afternoon. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Robert, and uh, he will take care of answering some questions and we'll give, give us a few minutes, and uh, let's see where we go from here. Thank you. Awesome. Bravo. Thank you, Edward. Appreciate that. So, yeah, if you have any questions, um, feel free to type them in the Zoom chat or the q and I've already made note of a few of them. Um, hold on for one second. So just as a point of FYI, Thanks so much for Edward for joining us and sharing some of his knowledge with a really interesting uh, discussion as usual and a lot of really interesting images as well. And let me go back. So this is part of a series of programs that Edward has done. And if you wanna go back and watch the previous ones, you can find them on our YouTube page. So just kind of in summary, uh, the first one he did was called Enslaved Washington, History of Washington DC from 1790 to 2021. Then there was the Empire of Blood talking about the European slavery history. Then there was Slavery Nation, 1495 to Jim Crow, Slavery and the US Economy, and then rise black resistance. And again, you can find all of those on our YouTube page, which is Washington DC history and culture. So thanks so much for that. Um, let's see, hold on one second. So yeah, we did have some questions came up, Edward, if you don't mind uh, sharing a little bit more of your knowledge. The first one, first question, Edward came from Patty and she always asks a lot of interesting questions. And this is uh, another example of that. She says, was an outlawing of marijuana in the early 20th century accomplished at least partly through drawing strong associations with Mexicans and Mexican Americans? I'm not familiar with that um, topic, but do you have any knowledge about that? Um, I'm gonna say <clears throat> all the way through the 60s and the cartel wars in Mexico through the 80s and 90s, yes. 
but I don't know any more about it. And rather than uh, Patty, rather than say that, I'm going to just leave it leave it at that. Okay, no problem. Robert, and then, what, is this, what is this I'm looking at over here? Oh, um, that's your screen. Never mind. Okay. Oh yeah, let me go back. Um, let's see. Hold on a second. Here, let me stop share. Sorry about that. Okay. okay. Um, let's see. So then another question from Medi came in. Why would President Obama, a black person, extol the virtue of American exceptionalism? Any thoughts on that one? Um, I do, exactly. I mean, I, I think that Obama has had the same education the rest of us had. Uh, he, he has, he's been, I won't say it, he's been fed the same narratives that the rest of us has been, but uh, he, he changed his mind. He learned to change his mind on a number of issues. Uh, uh, when he, when someone first asked him about uh, gay marriage, he says, "Well, you know, I'm not there yet. I need to think about that." And there was a lot of things he was not there yet for. Uh, <clears throat> and American exceptionalism doesn't sound bad on the surface, but when you see what it means, it turns out, then it becomes something different. It's like okay. the Marshall Plan. We think about the Marshall Plan, and think, "Oh, what's really wonderful." Uh, we don't think of it as a as a charity service to those who basically are going to be our dependents. Okay, no problem. And then there was a question about Obama and the birther movement, but I couldn't quite understand um, what the question was. There was a, like some typos in it, but I think what they were uh, asking was like a two part question. Um, number one, would the birther thing have even come up if Obama was white? Um, and number two, have there been any other kind of um, instances like that throughout history where we were like questioning someone's um, fact that they were legally born here that you know of? Well, Kamala Harris, for example. <clears throat> Bridgerton, for example, the wife of King George, uh, who, who knew that she was actually a, a, a black lady, uh, a, a former slave from, um, from uh, Deutschland, Germany. Okay. Uh, we can go back to, you, they, <clears throat> they go back to even Jesus's like, birth identity is, is, is part of that particular narrative. So he definitely wasn't the first person to be in no, kind of caught no, up in that no. um, type of thing. That's common in the common in the playbook of history to question. Mm. Uh, Thomas Paine, one of the earlier, one of the uh, Thomas Jefferson, the uh, and when he was running for president, he had the scandal of of, uh, of actually having. They were using against him the scandal that he was actually having a relationship with an enslaved girl. It gets worse, obviously, because the enslaved girl was the half sister of his of his of his legal wife, and he had children by her. Um, and so Adams, there was, uh, Alexander Hamilton, there was a question of, of where he was born and his basic, uh, um, origins. So places of, uh, the fundamentalism of birth is very much a playing card in lots of ways. Okay, no problem. And then here's a two part question from Carol. I'll actually um, give my thoughts on this because um, I have a little bit of knowledge of this and then I'll let you uh, share your thoughts. Edward, this comes from Carol. She says, during World War II, did Americans know that Ford Motor Company was a Hitler supporter um, or Henry Ford was a Hitler supporter and did Ford Motor Company profit during the war? So I used to work yes, at Ford Motor Company for a number of years. I'm very familiar with their history. And so the the situation that Americans have with Hitler is complex because the Hitler of say um, 1944 is known a lot more about his values and opinions and say the Hitler of um, the mid 1930s or even the late 1930s. So for Ford, yeah, there were some aspects of his kind of um, situation that a number of people, not just Henry Ford um, admired. Um, and I mean, look at the fact that Germany was awarded uh, the Olympics and countries went and participated in that and he was getting uh, kind of financial partnerships. Over time though, of course, their situation evolved and they learned more about him and they pulled out. And then their question, did Ford profit during the war? Absolutely, because they Ford was one of the major defense contractors of World War II. And so, yeah, they received a lot of profits from the war, but that being said, they also contributed greatly to the success of American industry. So that's my take on it. But Edward, what about yourself? Well, don't get me started, Robert. And you, uh, I do a whole thing on uh, Henry Ford and, and uh, uh, Hitler had a, had a life-size image of Henry Ford on his desk and on, in his office. People said, why? He says, I admire the man. Uh, Henry Ford was given the, the was the first American to be given the Order of the Eagle Award. Uh, it was given the second year that it was founded by Hitler in 1937. Um, when Hitler's when uh, the Protocols of Zion were printed uh, by Henry Ford's not Henry Ford so much as as his publishing company, 
uh, the Nazi party bought them up in the thousands and simply gave them away. So there's very much a link there. Um, and in terms of, but any kind of, what Robert is right, is that any kind of mechanized firm in, in Germany were using, a, 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 the Nazi Germany's literally borrowed not only the language, but the techniques of the Zyklon B, as I said, which was the death agent in, uh, in Auschwitz. We were, we were experimenting with it in 1920 at, at El Paso for Immigration. Yeah, and again, Henry Ford is a really complex individual. He's um, gotten a lot of notoriety for his anti-Semitic views. But then at Ford Motor Company, um, they were actually progressive in some aspects. They were early, um, say, promoters of African-Americans into supervisory positions um, at a time when that was not really commonplace in American, say, manufacturing um, setting. So yeah, Henry, Henry Ford's a really, it's with, when you're talking about someone like Henry Ford, who's very complex and had a very long career, it's hard to really give sometimes definitive answers because, you know, things evolved uh, <clears throat> over time. And then let's see, Edward, this was another one where I wasn't quite sure what the person was asking, I think, because as they were typing, they, some um, extra characters got struck over. I think they were asking about, they're saying when something like, I'm an American and I don't know a lot about Canada, but I don't hear Canada having as many of these um, racial type issues as are here in the United States. And I think they were asking, look, do you have kind of a basic uh, summary of why that is, or, or is that true? And well, if so, why is that? We're, we're not American, actually. We're U.S. Canada is American. Latin America is American. And it, it seems like a small point, but as a matter of fact, uh, we have oh, yeah, someone from Brazil is South American. Right. We have colonized the name uh, itself. But as a matter, I did reference it earlier in terms of the Royal Treaty of 1973, which is an important legal document. And the California or the California, the, the Canadian First Peoples, uh, which are, how do I say this? Um, the, the indigenous nations in the United States, I'm going to be talking about this in another one of these series as we go on. Um, have learned all of their politics from the first peoples of Canada uh, who are much more politically savvy and much more, I wouldn't say aggressive, but much more um, determined not to be erased. So, and I do think there's a kind of myopia that we get into with CNN and Fox. Our news is really very uninteresting, but if you read, uh, we, you, we, there was just a, a, a page or two if you read The Economist or if you read other non, uh, even, even the International Herald is going to help. Uh, but here we get, we end up getting the new, uh, we end up getting CNN and we end up getting Fox. Um, the Washington, or the New York Times, for example, in the United Nations made a 2016 kind of, uh, uh, basically condemned the United States for its uh, racist policies and its lack of operations. I think the United, you know, the, the New York Times might have covered it in a paragraph, for example. So. Our news tends to be fairly myopic. Right. Okay. That makes sense. And then this was another uh, interesting question. This was from Sue. And Edward, she's asking you to look into your crystal ball. And if you could look five or 10 years into the future, do you have any predictions of this situation getting worse, uh, better, or staying the same? What's your prediction? About that? In 1986, my first year at Georgetown University, where I was teaching fresh people. Um, I taught them Margaret Edwards' Handmaid's Tale, period. And, and that's my crystal ball. And for those not familiar with that, what's... Oh, 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 oh you not familiar with... Explain that a little bit further. If you're not familiar, well, it's like the Northwest imperative um, turned into a religious... It's, you know, it's the Christian version of, uh, of the caliphate. It's a theocracy. It, it's what Massachusetts started being, a theocracy. Okay. Good luck. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> well, and then um, at the beginning, you were discussing this. Can you tell us about your future topics that you'll be? We don't, I, we haven't, Edward and I haven't worked out the dates exactly for that, but we'll do so um, in the next few days and send that out. But can you talk a little bit about the um, future programs you're going to be doing in this series? You well, did a little bit at the beginning. I've, I've talked, and if, if people want to pressure me into doing the, uh, the Nazi Germany eugenics and the U.S. Uh, back and forth between, uh, again, Ford and the Rockefeller Foundation and Nazi Germany and uh, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes and Nuremberg. I'll be glad to do that one. Oh, yeah, you should do that because um, actually in December is the 60th anniversary of the start of World War 
or sorry, the 80th anniversary of the start of World War II here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Then you signed me up for that one, but there are okay. two I want, to, I want to address here. One, which I mentioned earlier, which is legal, which simply looks at the laws and social practices that gives the defines what I call white apartheid. Again, it's not simply we're segregating black people, we're segregating white people and we're doing it by law, it's apartheid. So it's not this, oh, well, you know, uh, South Africa had apartheid, we just have segregation. No, it's, it's law. So it, it's, it's going to be a walk through state constitutions. It's going to be a walk through. We can talk about all the laws that we have on a federal level, Robert, that, that might be forward thinking, maybe. But it's the, it's the social laws, the state laws, the country laws. You know, it's like masking laws, for example. I mean, whatever the, whatever the federal government might be saying is that individual places, schools, countries, uh, counties, I mean, can do what they want. So the same thing obtains in terms of uh, what I'm calling legal. So okay. I, looked at, I looked at one of them with the, with the, the Alabama state constitution, for example. And then the other one is simply- Okay, so we'll do that in October. So stay tuned for the date um, on that. And again, Edward and I will get that squared away in the next few days. And then what about in November? They, um, well, I'm ready to go with the exterminate them, which is uh, the expression is from uh, George Washington and it's about the indigenous uh, people his army is fighting, facing. So it's a, it's a walk through, um, it's the 457, uh, it, it's, a, it's a walk through the story of the indigenous nations here in this country um, in the same way that we did the slaver nation for black okay. people. Okay, excellent. We're going to do that in November because November is Native American Heritage Month. So, okay, well, excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for everyone who joined us today. Um, again, the recording will be out um, at some point in time in the next day or two on our YouTube channel. And thanks so much for Edward, as always, for sharing his knowledge with us and giving us some things to think about. So thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday and your weekend. And we will see you all next time. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Be at peace. Exactly. Thank you.